many people know the basic outline of Tolkien's childhood in in so far as he was born in South Africa. Uh, his mother and uh, took him and his, his brother uh, on a trip to England when they were very small. His father dies in South Africa while they're in England. They never go back to South Africa. Um, later on, his mother converts to Catholicism. The boys become Catholic. She dies of diabetes. Then they are adopted by this oratorian priest, Father Francis Morgan. Um, Tolkien considers his mother to be something of a martyr because um, she had been basically disowned financially by most of her family uh, upon becoming Catholic. And so what I want to get into, though, is a little bit more of the details of that experience and and the context of England and what the what the actual aside from being cut off financially and the suffering of that what the actual dangers were for the children as uh, Catholic orphans in England. Right. Well, the first thing to to realize is that um, England um, in the early twentieth century. So you know, Mabel, Mabel became a Catholic in nineteen hundred. So right right at the start of the of the new century, um, the culture was extremely anti Catholic. Um, Catholics were a very small minority. And we should remember in the larger context, Catholicism in England after the Reformation had been made illegal. There were horrific penalties for even the basic practice of the Catholic faith um, during the you know, penal times of uh, you know, Elizabeth especially. And although those draconian penalties, um, death for sheltering priests, for instance, um, those were eased off, you know, the civil disabilities lasted for centuries. So Catholics couldn't, for instance, vote. Um, they couldn't hold uh, ordinary like civil offices up until the mid 1800s. Uh, they couldn't, they were for instance, excluded from the great universities in Oxford until until 1854, if you wanted to matriculate to enter Oxford, you had to affirm the 39, <clears throat> the 39 articles, which is a specifically Anglican declaration of faith that specifically excludes <laughs> Catholics and nonconformists and atheists and, and Jewish people, um, but is aimed specifically, really specifically at Catholics in his rejection of for, you know, things like transubstantiation. Um, and so Catholics could not go to the universities. This doesn't end until 1854. It isn't until 1871 that finally Catholics can be fellows, um, you know, hold the university positions. That's only 30 years before Mabel becomes a Catholic. Um, and when there had been any sort of um, reprieve in, you know, in, in returning civil rights to Catholics, there would be things like riots in the streets. <laughs> literal riots, the Gordon riots, for instance, people, you know, saying down with popery. So this is the context in which Mabel becomes a Catholic, um, in which there are still restrictions on Catholics and their civil rights. Some of them didn't get, you know, ended until actually Tolkien's adult life. And the atmosphere, the environment was one in which the Anglican establishment was very much the establishment. To, so to be a Catholic was to be socially marginalized, um, typically poorer. Um, it meant you were excluded from a lot of a lot of English culture and opportunities. Um, even the churches were cheap and ugly um, because at the Reformation, you know, the the establishment took over all of the existing parish churches, and so Catholics had nowhere to worship. First, it was illegal, and then they just didn't have anywhere. Uh, so we have, you know, for a Catholic of Mabel, she would be going from experiencing worship in potentially a very beautiful, old, um, elegant church to attending a crowded mass at some kind of cheap and nasty, you know, brick, brick building. Um, so it's very much a huge cultural shift for her. And I think that's important to emphasize because it really underscores that it was a move of conscience for Mabel. She wasn't just sort of shopping around for a nicer way of worship. Um, she wasn't just sort of, oh, this sounds good, I'll try it. It came with a real cost. And so she became a Catholic out of evidently a deep personal conviction. And she held to it. And I think this is where Tolkien's understanding of her as a martyr really comes in. 
she held to that faith, even when it cost her socially, familially, health-wise, economically, it would have been so easy for her to revert back. And she didn't. Um, and that's, that I think is significant. Right. Well, uh, you also mentioned her sister, right? Uh, who became Catholic for, for a minute and then was pulled back into the Anglican church. Yeah. I mean, it really, it gives you a good case study because her, her sister May was actually received um, in the same month as her. They both received instruction together. And then within a week of each other, both May and Mabel um, were received into the Catholic church, but her sister, um, her husband was alive and he was extremely upset by his wife becoming a Catholic and he simply forbade it. He said, you, you, are not ever to enter a Catholic church again. And she either accepted that or capitulated to that, depending on how you want to think about it. And that brings us to another aspect of, of the cost of it and the dangers of it, as you, as you noted, because there were children involved. Um, the courts were very biased in favor of the Protestant view of things. And mm. so, for instance, if her sister's husband had decided to separate from her, in the current legal cultural situation, he could simply have taken her daughters and forbade her to see them, and she would never have seen her children again, and that would have been upheld. Now, Mabel, her husband, had died, still an Anglican. Um, so what would happen when Mabel died um, if her, with her boys as Catholics? Well, a lot of times what happened is that the Protestant relatives would swoop in and even take families to court, even with living mothers, take the family to court to regain custody of the children so they could mm -hmm. raise them as Protestants. So raising her sons in this faith, which she had accepted at such cost, was actually quite a challenge for Mabel because she was well aware that the extended family was very much against it. And they would have wanted the boys to be raised Protestant. And because their father had been an Anglican, they could easily have made a case in court. Oh, we're bringing the boys back to the faith of their father. Um, never mind the wishes of the mother. Never mind the wishes of the boys themselves. We're going to take them back. And in fact, when when Mabel died, there was a little bit of talk amongst the family of contesting the will and and bringing the boys into a Protestant boarding school. Um, so all of this brings us to a key factor in Mabel's decision making, which I think has been a bit overlooked. We know that eventually she ends up at the Birmingham Oratory and that Father Francis Morgan, a priest of the Oratory, becomes the boy's guardian. He's the executor of Mabel's will. Well, how did she end up at the Oratory? She's, she goes to a couple of different churches first, finally ends up there. Why the Oratory? The Oratory at that time was not particularly impressive in terms of the building. It was a dingy, shabby little building at the time. If she'd wanted something closer to her Anglican, you know, architectural beauties of, of worship, she could have gone to St. Chad's Cathedral, which was a newish cathedral in Birmingham, very beautiful. She goes to the Oratory instead. And I think it's precisely because it's the Oratorians brought to Birmingham by John Henry Newman. Um, and I think the Newman influence through the Oxford movement was a big part of why Mabel became a Catholic to begin with. And most significantly, the Oratorian fathers at that time were nearly all converts and they understood the landscape. They understood being a Protestant. Mm. They weren't afraid of it or, or contemptuous. They knew what it was like to make that change. And also the Birmingham Oratorians had special insight into helping convert women. And they had even protected some families, you know, during court proceedings when Protestant you know, extended family tried to take the children away. So by bringing her family to the Birmingham Oratory, Mabel was coming to a place where she and the boys could get instructed by priests who actually understood their background. So they would know what they did and didn't know about the Catholic faith um, coming from the Anglican background and who would help ensure that the boys would be raised up Catholic, which they did. One more thing about Tolkien's family. You mentioned in the book that he actually does end up having relationships with his relatives, uh, even ones who hadn't had sort of 
not done anything to help his mother when uh, he was younger. Yes, and this is remarkable. And it's so often taken for granted because we see that the family is very hostile to Mabel becoming a Catholic. And then, I mean, and then on her deathbed, um, her sister May comes, none of the other family comes. Her own parents don't come to see her when she's dying. Uh, this is, it's a bit shocking, but this is in line with the hard line that Protestants would take, you know, in a sense, they were taking it very seriously. And well, maybe, maybe this is how she'll finally come back to the fold. If we would just, we're just not gonna go to her. It might be a tacit, you know, affirmation of, of this Catholic mm. thing. Um, so she's, she's, during her life, her family is very hostile to her faith. But then we go forward into, you know, Tolkien's boyhood and he's going on family trips. He's, he's spending time with his cousins. What happened? And we have to look at Father Francis Morgan. Um, and there's a, there's a line in one of Tolkien's letters where he says that Father Francis first taught him charity and forgiveness. And I think that unlocks a lot of that relationship. Because Father Francis, you know, as the ward of the two boys, he could easily have just isolated them from the extended family. That would have been kind of the easier thing to do. But he was a very big hearted man. And I think he knew his orphaned wards needed their family. It was harder to make those connections and still preserve their Catholic faith, but it was worth doing. And so he, he must have reached out. He did reach out. Um, we know some instances in which he reached out to the family to, you know, to make those connections. And he evidently helps the boys to, to rebuild those relationships while still building up their Catholic faith. And so that must have included learning charity towards his relatives who didn't share his beliefs and maybe were dismissive or sometimes contemptuous of them. It meant forgiving them for whatever he, he might have held against them for not supporting his mother. I think there's a, a sort of a little pastoral miracle going on mm. here. Um, with Father Francis nurturing this sense of forgiveness um, and allowing him to have these relationships that end up being you know, important to him. Right, yeah, that's a great point. 